These are the three types of drones that are changing warfare in 2025. First, we have the anti-drone drones, which I can't think of a better name for that. So that's what we're going to go with for now. Second, we have wire guided or fiber optic drones. And then third, USVs or unmanned surface vessels, waterborne drones that just recently started shooting down enemy helicopters. Yes, you heard that last part correct. What a terrifying time we live in. Huh? Now, uh, starting out with an honorable mention, I guess this kind of falls under the anti-drone drones, which I should trademark, uh, the shotgun wielding drone. I feel like we had to mention this because that's pretty wild in a lot of ways. These have been circulating this idea for a long time. It's not going to be the kind of thing that changes how war is carried out. It's just there's a lot of finicky items here, a lot that can go wrong. It's relatively expensive to put together, but nonetheless, we are seeing it used more and more. So I felt like it was at least worth sharing some of that footage, right? I mean, just last week, we saw some clips of a Ukrainian drone with shotguns attached, shooting down Russian drones. And when it ran out of targets, it pointed those barrels down and started hunting Russians on the ground with buckshot. That's horrifying in so many ways. But that's kind of where we are. Now, the United States has actually worked a little bit with some shotgun wielding drones. I was out at uh, Defense Innovation Unit a couple months ago, they were showing us one of their prototypes and it was using the type of round it was using was chain shot i think is the way to put it remember uh in cannons when they try to shoot down or knock down enemy mast on a ship they'd have two cannonballs with a chain attached between the two that they have that in shotgun shells like buckshot attached with something i guess it has a better chance of bringing down drones either way we are going to see more and more of these shotgun wielding drones in drone defense used in the battlefield I wouldn't expect it to drastically change the nature of warfare, at least not as much as this next one, which is crazy because it's not very fancy at all. It's a stick on a drone. That's kind of it. Uh, but the simplicity and the cost effectiveness means that we are seeing this used widely all across the front in Ukraine. So picture this. You're a Ukrainian soldier in the trenches in the east, and there's an enemy drone, a Russian drone overhead. Maybe you pick it up on your radar. Maybe you see it. It's got to go. There are zero scenarios where you want an enemy drone overhead ever. So assuming your electronic warfare systems can't jam it and, and bring it down out of the sky, you've got to look in the toolkit. What can you do to bring this thing down? First off, you have surface-to-air missile systems, man pads, man portable air defense systems, stingers things like that, right? Used to bring down helicopters and low-flying jets. There's a bunch of those in Ukraine right now. They're also very expensive. Uh, there's nowhere near as many stingers as there are drones flying over the battlefield, especially when you're talking about some of these smaller quadcopter-type drones. Uh, and the cost differential is insane. You're talking about $150,000, $200,000 per stinger missile, and these drones are like three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a piece. So you don't want to do that trade very much. And anyways, those stingers are better utilized for bigger targets, things like cruise missiles or Shahed, kind of the long range drones that Russia has been firing. So no stingers, also not a lot of units at the front are going to have stingers, at least in the quantity to shoot down the dozens of drones they might come across on a daily basis. Um, so let's shift over to small arms fire, right? All the soldiers have a variety of small arms. Now that drone is probably at a distance if it's conducting some sort of recon. If it comes in for a strike, Shotguns have actually been pretty effective, which has got to be terrifying, right? It's like shooting skeet with your life on the line. Uh, but we've seen, you know, quite a few drones at this point being shot down at close range with shotguns. That can work. But let's talk about a drone a little further off, like two kilometers away. That's going to have plenty of line of sight to see you and all of your guys in the trench line. And the shotgun, of course, isn't going to range it. Small arms, maybe. Now, most of the small arms in the squad aren't going to be able to effectively range something at two kilometers away. But even the weapon systems that you do have that can reach out and touch something at that distance, the likelihood of actually hitting something the size of a shoebox that's moving, away, moving around at two, three kilometers, like, it's a lucky shot at best. On top of that, as soon as you open fire, you give away your position. You know, we don't know what the drone's doing up there. Maybe it's looking for you and doesn't know where your position is yet. So the last thing you want to do is step out, give away your position with no realistic chance of shooting that drone down. Enter the drone carrying a stick, which we need a better name for that one. Maybe anti-drone drone is what we're going with. We'll wait and see how that plays out. It's cheap. It doesn't require any significant modifications, and most frontline units have their own fair share of drones. We have seen a couple drones at times that use nets to kind of drop and capture enemy drones, but 
They're only carrying one of those at a time. They have to source that net. They have to attach it just right. And if they miss, they're just you go back up, try again a few minutes later, maybe. This anti-drone drone with a stick, you fly it up, you don't give away your position, you come around behind the enemy drone in the sky, you crash into it, like all of these videos right here. That drone comes crashing down to the earth, problem solved, right? And the enemy might not have any idea what just happened at all. Also, this ramming method doesn't require any sort of like special pilot skills or unique technology. It's pretty easily implemented, like right now by any unit that can put this together. So yes, we are starting to see these more and more, these ramming drones used by Russia and Ukraine. I would expect it to proliferate even further into 2025. The second type of drone changing warfare in 2025 are the wire guided or fiber optic drones like we see here. You can see how crystal clear that picture is. These have been incredibly lethal across multiple areas of the front. And we'll talk about why after a thank you to the sponsor of today's video. Well, it's a new year, new me, new you, same old internet, for better or for worse. I mean, those cringe Facebook posts that were deleted years ago are still somehow out there for your soldiers to find and change to the background on their computer so the whole unit can see it, but who cares? That's water under the bridge at this point. Now, the sponsor of today's video can't magically erase all evidence of your past bad decisions, but they can at least prevent our sensitive data from being used by bad actors. Groups that can genuinely do real damage with things like our personally identifiable information. So Delete Me is a subscription service that constantly scans the internet for your personal information, and when it's found, they have it removed. And look, there's no way to ever 100% remove all of your data from the internet. That's just the nature of the world that we live in today. The value of Delete Me is that they're working 24-7, 365 to identify and remove your information. So when bad actors come along to a data broker looking to buy some sort of data in bulk, yours has been removed from, at the very least, the most recent bundles. So in short, Delete Me kind of helps you to become more of a harder target. It's a platform that I use to protect myself and my family. So to get started today, scan the QR code on the screen here or use the link in my bio along with code PRESTON for 20% off all consumer plans. And now, back to the video. All right, so a challenge all across the front for both Ukraine and Russia has been electronic warfare, which is a very broad term, but generally speaking in this context, it's referring to the ability to sever the connection between the drone and the drone operator or pilot. In fact, here's a video right here showing how it works in practice. So this is a Russian drone that identified and moves in to strike a Ukrainian truck. As it gets close, the electronic warfare package goes into effect or it's turned on or the drone just gets within range of their uh, their jamming distance. And you can see it it loses connection, right? The pilot has no idea where when it comes crashing down to the earth. That's the end for that drone. Now, I've talked about this before, so I know where this goes. Somebody's going to say, I'm a drone pilot, and you just put return to sender, and the drone comes back to you, and you're good to go. Listen, these... These are drones with explosive charges and point detonating fuses that go boom when they hit something. It's a homemade missile. There is no scenario where you want that thing coming back home. A drone pilot in Ukraine or in Russia is not going to be in that job very long. If they send a drone off to try to strike an enemy target, it gets shut down with electronic warfare, and then you have no idea where it is, and all of a sudden that thing comes back and strikes a friendly position. So, no. No return to sender, <laughs> you know, come back home. That is not, not a good feature when you're talking about FPV style strike drones in this war. Now, what we've seen in certain areas of the front is just a massing of electronic warfare, especially areas where like Ukraine went into Kursk a couple months ago and they effectively shut down that airspace entirely. There were reports coming from Russia that the electronic warfare was so dense in that area that 90% of Russians, Russia's drones were falling out of the sky, completely useless. So the workaround that Russia kind of spearheaded, but Ukraine is caught up with in a couple different ways here, is they added a wire. They hardwired the drone or the homemade missile. So you literally have this thing flying 5, 10, sometimes 20 kilometers away with a wire connecting it back to the operator. So we'll run through some pros and cons here, starting with the pros because we want to be, it's an optimistic video, I feel like, right? So the pros, of course, uh, it's not jammable at least by any of the same technology. It's probably done some way, but that's for people smarter than me. Uh, the radio signal can't be intercepted. How about that? Another big pro here is the quality of the feed. 
Now, in this war, and we're seeing this as it's going to play out in other wars going forward, it's not so much about just getting the drone to hit the target. They're trying to hit the target in exactly the right spot. There's certain portions of vehicles where if you hit it, it's still going to operate, no issue. Whereas other areas could be a catastrophic kill, completely destroy the vehicle, maybe kill everybody inside, or immobilize it to where it can't be utilized. So it's not just hit the vehicle, it's hit the vehicle in the right spot. Look at the two drone feeds I have on the screen here. One is from a fiber optic, one is from a traditional drone, a radio controlled drone. Do you see how much clearer it would be to hit a specific point on the vehicle when you're using those fiber optic drones? So a couple big positives there. Now let's shift over to the downsides here. One of course is range. You have to have a cable dragging behind this thing the entire way. So it's going to be slightly lower range, you have to imagine. Now, I have heard some reports that these are reaching out to 20 plus kilometers, which is a lot of cable. And that actually means something else, which is weight. So let's say any drone or the drone being used for these strike missions, let's say it can carry 10 pounds and it can fly out to 20 kilometers and has a a flight time of 30 minutes. It can be airborne for 30 minutes. So 10 pounds carried out to 20 kilometers can stay in the air for 30 minutes. If you add even two pounds of this fiber optic cable, which is incredibly lightweight and incredibly thin, but it still adds up when you have like 20 kilometers worth of it, say that's two pounds. That two pounds is going to have an impact on the drone. It's either going to result in a, a shorter range, a less uh, less time it can stay airborne, or in a lot of cases, what we're seeing is a smaller warhead being attached to the drone. So there is a significant trade-off that has to happen here. And then, of course, there's the actual cable getting hung up on something, anything. Even if this is just going out 5, 10 kilometers, that's an active battlefield. you got to think that some percentage of these, the cable is being cut and the drone is completely losing any connection with the operator. And then, again, who knows where that thing ends up. Now, I haven't really seen any reports from Ukraine or Russia talking about how often that is happening, the severing of that cable, but common sense tells us that it's it's a real thing. It absolutely has to be. But either way, it is looking like these wire-guided or fiber optic drones are producing catastrophic results on the battlefield. I think a portion of that has to do with just the quality of the feed. They're able to really identify key areas of a vehicle or a structure to strike, but nonetheless, and there's a, a bias here based off of the footage that does come out versus what doesn't, because then we don't know that side of it, but a lot of fiber optic drone footage is showing very successful strikes recently from both the Ukrainian and the Russian side. Then shifting over to the third type of drone that is changing warfare in 2025, and this is one that I feel like we really need to pay attention to in the United States. The other two are already happening. This one, you can really see where it's going to go, and it could be a big problem for us and our allies around the world. USVs, unmanned surface vessels. These little 18-foot boats that you see on the screen here, Ukraine used to effectively shut off the Black Sea from the Russian Navy, which is wild because, you know, back up a little bit. Uh, when Russia invaded in 2022, Ukraine essentially had no navy. What they had was pretty quickly scuttled, and there was no you know, major naval engagements that were going to happen. At the very start of the war, there were some concerns that Russia might use the Black Sea, which makes up you know, the entire southern coast of Ukraine, as a launching pad for an amphibious assault into some place like Odessa, coming from Crimea. In retrospect, that was probably never really in the cards. But nonetheless, Russia did use the Black Sea for the opening months of the war to sling a lot of missiles from their ships into Ukrainian territory. So Ukraine had to find a way to kind of shut that down. And they started by firing missiles to some effect. I mean, they sunk the Moskva. And you did see some Russian ships start to move back. But there's a problem there. Ukraine doesn't have a lot of missiles. They're very expensive. And Russian defenses are kind of set up to defend against missiles. So Ukraine went the route of the unmanned surface vessel. It's a boat with explosives in it, and you drive the boat into something and it blows up. It's not really a new technology. It's not really a new concept, I should say. New technology, not a new concept. This Magura V5 that you're seeing here is domestically manufactured in Ukraine. It costs about $300,000. It's 18 feet long. There's not much to it. And Ukraine has been sending these out in swarms of five, six, seven, eight boats at a time to pretty significant effects destroying Russian naval ships to the point where the Russian Navy, by and large, has said enough of that. They're not going to patrol the Black Sea. They're going to move back into port where they set up submarine nets to protect their fleet from these cheap drones. Again, $300,000 a pop is pretty cheap for something that can move an entire Navy back into port. Now, the way that Russia decided to deal with these was first moving the ships to a safe location, second, setting up submarine nets, and third, they put helicopters overhead. And look, this actually kind of looked 
fun. I don't know. It's like something you could book for a bachelor party, right? Door gunners are, are sitting there hunting down these drones that are not shooting back, and you just get to shoot at things. Imagine doing that at our night vision devices, and you're shooting at these things, and when you hit one, they blow up. Like, I don't know. I, sign me up, right? That actually kind of sounds cool. But then they started shooting back. The USV started shooting back. First was with rocket launchers, and more on that in a second because we're going to tie it all together. Uh, but just recently, Ukraine showed that they had added surface air missile systems. And it was like three weeks ago or something, uh, they confirmed that they shot down two Russian helicopters. So the defense against these drones just got shot out of the sky. So that whole shooting drones from helicopter door gunners, it had a window where it would have been fun. It's probably not going to be fun now, and it's not entirely sure how Russia is going to deal with this going forward. They're trying to figure that out because it's a major issue and something we probably need to think about. I mean, think about this concept for a second. If you got a fleet, call it 10, 15 or so of these USVs, what if some of them have surface air missile systems, some of them have rocket launchers, and some of them are just explosive boats? Can you see how this would play out and how much of a challenge it would be? So imagine you've got this formation of these USVs approaching a naval task force, something like that. And at the very front, you've got a couple of these uh, USVs with these surface air missile systems. So any aircraft coming nearby are going to get shot out of the sky. And then as they get even closer, those rocket pods can unload. And I should note that unguided rockets at baseline are incredibly inaccurate. You add in a little sway, a little pitch in that water, that first rocket to the last, it could be a couple miles difference from where the first to the last lands. But it's still, depending on the target and the distance, could be effective at suppressing a target, at least get somebody's head down if there's rockets firing overhead. And then in the midst of all of that, you've got more of these boats filled with explosives charging through to impact the side of ships. Do you see how that could be a problem for the United States, for any country with a Navy around the world? And we're kind of seeing the opening steps of that play out right now in Ukraine. So the other two, the anti-drone drones and the wire-guided drones, this is how they're impacting the war in 2025. These USVs with different capabilities massing together to destroy portions of a naval fleet, I think this is the opening scene, and we're just going to see it become deadlier and deadlier for navies to operate. But that's all I've got for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all next time.